Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode three of SEO Fight Club. Uh, I will switch over to the slides and we'll dive right in. Okay, so uh, are you seeing my slides okay, Kyle? I am indeed. Excellent. So this episode is on testing methods, and before everyone runs away uh, for fear of a boring episode, there's the thing. If we tell you about our testing method, we ultimately have to show you some of our tests. And so that's where you're going to get uh, the, the really cool nuggets, but maybe you'll learn about how you can test things for yourself and, you know, how as a community, maybe we can raise the bar together. Um, but, you know, before we dive in, uh, let's go ahead and get through some housekeeping. Uh, instead of going through the introductions this time, uh, Kyle mentioned he'd like to stop doing that, and I agree. So you have Kyle to thank. Uh, if you want to learn about who we are and what we do, just go to seofightclub.org. We have uh, little bios about us there. Um, so please do that. And I'd like to jump in and find out what we can learn on uh, this week's episode of SEO This Week with Clint Butler. Uh, so this week we went over, actually found a lady who was summarizing the Google Webmaster Talks, the ones that John, what's his next talks about, goes through. You know, the most boring two hours of internet video ever. Uh, she sits through that and pulls out some good information out of there. So I found that's one of the significant posts. There's a couple of new Google releases. Uh, Lighthouse is getting an update so it can actually read WordPress. Uh, you can learn about that. And we had Terry Power on with Ted this time. And so we got a third party perspective. And then he talked a little bit about some stuff he's doing with Google Maps. The uh, woman that's doing the webmaster synopsis, does she also give interpretation? She doesn't. It's more, this was the question. Here's what his answer is. So that's I great, think though. It's, yeah, it's a good opportunity to take that and just kind of, there's, there's some built in tests for us right there. For sure. Very cool. And I highly recommend that if you haven't checked out SEO this week, that you do so. Um, this week, I, I, my understanding is that Clint went through like 185 articles about SEO to narrow it down to the five or six that appear to really matter most to experts. So if, you know, if you're starving for time to get through all that to find the important tidbits, uh, this podcast is just amazing for that. So please check it out. So uh, one more bit of boilerplate. Uh, if you haven't heard about my software, it's called Cora. I'm having a free webinar about it to uh, tell people, to introduce it, to tell people what it can do for them, uh, how it works, what it does. So if you would like to learn about Cora, uh, this is the webinar for you. It'll be on Friday at uh, 1 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and just visit the URL here to register. And there's a new segment I'm adding to uh, the show called Late Rebuttals. Uh, so when people bring up good points about past arguments on different episodes, uh, we can talk about them here and make sure that we uh, set the record straight. So uh, Derek, uh, I was a yuck, uh, from assimilation. Hopefully, I got his last name right. It's a trick. They don't even bother trying to pronounce his last name anymore. <laughs> um, uh, shout out to the assimilation folks if you're uh, in the audience today. Uh, this is regarding episode one and skyscraper content versus smaller articles with higher keyword density. We made some little claims in that area with some data. And uh, Derek fired back, hey, the main reason you would still want to go with the skyscraper content is all the other keywords you could rank for in that content. And I thought that was a very important and valid point, and we kind of uh, omitted that. Uh, so what do you guys think about that? You know, he's he's got a valid point because you can do it through content, but I've done it just using anchor text uh, to smaller pages. So. Um, I guess is, you know, 
where you're going to do work one way or the other. So if you want to do longer content, then go for it. But I just do anchor text and it's just easier to me. What I have found is that uh, if you properly optimize for a primary keyword, there's a whole set of secondaries you can win. Uh, and you can typically find those in um, the related searches and, and, and Google Trends. So if you properly optimize for whatever your primary keyword is, if you do that search and then scroll down to the bottom of the SERPs, those terms that are there are terms that you can win often just by putting them one time on the page, sometimes not even on the page. Uh, but those are the the other ones you can win so long as you're staying within you know the right um, kind of structure. So as long as you make sure that you're staying within that, you're not getting too far afield uh, with your content, that your skyscraper content is still on point, and it's on point because you're kind of staying within those related searches, then I think you'd be fine. Where I think a lot of people just go off the rails is they write content for the sake of content, and they have these skyscraper things because they feel like they need all of these words, but it actually isn't um, uh, a cohesive document. It's not getting those related searches. It's going on to things that should just be other pages. Yeah, and uh, the other thing is if you go the skyscraper content route with a ton of keywords, it's almost impossible to tune for keyword density for lots of different keywords. So that entire avenue kind of leaves the table. Um, but still, I thought it was a valid point and worthy of discussion. Solid point, Derek. Okay, so uh, how do you test SEO stuff? That's what we're going to get into. So let's look at some of our uh, testing methods. So uh, let me stop and reshare. This is is this looking distorted to you too? Yes, yeah, so I was just about to ask why the production value is so low for this horribly <laughs> horribly <laughs> quality, poor quality show. I thought you were just yeah. making a game, man. <laughs> let me stop. Sure. Well, while you're fixing that, I should say this should be our, our lowest, uh, our last uh, low production show as we're going to be moving to Roku, or at least having a Roku channel. I was told I have to get a better camera as a result. So you have to up your slide game as well, Ted. That's how this works. All right, one second. Let's try this again. Then I switch back, reshare. Aha! Okay, so single variable testing is how uh, the advanced SEO community refers to what we're doing. So if you see people say SVT in forums, they're talking about this approach we're, we're going to describe. And the single variable testing is not new, as, as Kyle could tell you, it's, it's ancient <laughs> and uh, so it's been around forever. Um, in a nutshell, what we're doing is we invent imaginary keywords that no one on earth has ever used before. So we own them, we control them, there are no other pages for them, nobody is searching them. We have complete isolation on these magical imaginary keywords. And then we create five or more pages targeting that keyword. And we kind of let them stew for a while in Google. So if there's any uh, favoritism to the order in which they're created or indexed or anything like that, can have a chance to settle out. And then at some point after it's done enough uh, settling, we record a baseline. We say, hey, how did these you know default uh, test cases uh, rank, and we store that uh, default order. And then we go and we take a middle one, so there's room to go up or down, and we turn it into a test case. And so that's kind of it in a nutshell. And then, you know, obviously, we let that stew again, and we come back later and say, hey, did it go up or down? Uh, did I get that right, Kyle? Yeah, the only thing I would add is is the point of single variable. So anything you do to one needs to be done to all, unless it's the one thing that you're testing. Uh, a lot of people don't quite grasp that concept that they'll um, try to stagger different. Well, they'll take a single variable test and try to put multiple variables into it. What about this? What about that? Not realizing that those are all separate tests. Also, anything that you do to one, you want to do the other. So um, if you're going to make a change to your uh, test page and then resubmit it to Google or put it through an indexer, you'll want to do the exact same thing to all your control pages as well. You reply to someone who comes at you with, with 
But you're doing this on a fake keyword. How, how do you know that's going to work in real life? Well, what's well, great, great is, um, what is it? 15 to 20% of all searches uh, Google has never seen every day. So Google understands that there are terms that it just has never seen before. And as far as Google is concerned, this is just one of them. Cool. All right. So, Fight Club. Uh, <laughs> well, <clears throat> this this is an example. I, I created some example test pages and I put them on the Fight Club domain and I had Google index them and I'm showing you what it looks like. So that's you know kind of a an imaginary keyword that nobody uses. We have five cases. It's been stewing for a while. Um, and one important thing, uh, uh, well, we'll get into it later. There's there's these sources of error that I might believe are there, but we'll get into those in a bit. Um, so like I mentioned before, uh, we leave the top ones as control cases, and then we'll modify. So we have our, our keyword here that we're searching is the second to last word on the page. And if we're testing, you know, our keywords in bold tags a factor, we'll wrap this one in bold tags on the content of the page, but we'll leave all the others normal. So the only difference between the test uh, case and the control cases is this one, our keyword that appears only once on the page is wrapped in bold tags. And so otherwise they're equivalent and Hopefully, it moves up if it's a positive result. Any thoughts on that? Correct. And if it doesn't move, it's it's a nothing. And if it moves down, it's a negative result. OK. And Kyle? So Ted, this is something that you talked about, I think, maybe even two years ago. But it's the idea of consecutive events and the probability of them happening. happening and this is why we recreate the tests. Um, the idea of uh, you do the test once and, and the result goes to the top, or can you be confident that you've only tested one thing? Or can you be confident that this is reliable? What if Google is messing with us? That kind of thing. So the idea is that if, as you rerun the test and you get the same result, the probability uh, of this happening over and over, as you like to say, the coin is rigged, uh, diminishes. And statistical probability is at about 5%. And you can see that's somewhere between four and five times in a row, uh, where you get to the point that it's really unusual um, that this is happening. And in fact, we can get higher degrees of confidence that what we're seeing is an actual factor, a positive factor, a negative factor, just based on the probability of that happening again and again and again. Yep, good point. Uh, for, for a lot of uh, people, if you're testing if a coin is rigged, you know, by the time you get heads, you know, seven times in a row, most people are saying, hey, this seems really fishy. By the time you get to 100 in a row, I mean, it's absurd. You know the coin is, is rigged. And, uh, yeah, the reason I used this chart in, in the past were, was that people were telling me that because their search result has an estimated 10 million uh, pages, that my sample size was too low. And it's like, well, if you have a data set of, you know, 10 million coin flips, do you need to have a sample size of 100,000 to test if the coin is rigged? And the answer is no. Uh, but yeah, the, the consecutive testing adds to confidence. Exactly. So the uh, inverted test group, so if you're doing this uh, five test case things, one of the things you can do to have additional confidence in your testing is you, you invert the controls and test cases. So you would create five of the exact same test case, let them all settle, and then you would convert the middle one into a control case and see if it falls. That's exactly right. This is a, a, a big logical step forward that I think a lot of people miss, those that are attempting to do their own tests miss, but then also those that um, don't like these methods. The, it's something that a lot of people haven't realized it exists. So the idea is that uh, we run it multiple times and, and we see the factor go up 
uh, uh, and then we feel good about our degrees of, of consecutive events happening in a row. And then we invert it and run it the other way. Uh, this gets rid of the Google is messing with you um, uh, argument because that would be a wild coincidence that it could mess with us both moving something up and also moving something down at the same time. Again, with um, the ability to repeat the test and see that, that the coin is, is definitely rigged. Exactly. exactly. Question in the, in the chat is, does the the multivariates and multilayers of the live algorithm when you're, when you're actually doing this for, for real negate the single variable that you've tested whether it works or not? They're saying because there are other things involved in, in, in the in the um, uh, in in the regular algorithm, algorithm, if you will. Yeah. So you're ranking for SEO, and then you use the test, and you found out that I'll just keep a broad one. The H1 tags help your ranking in a single variable test. How do you? What makes you think that that's going to work when you're trying to rank for SEO? Sure. Well, at a, at a minimum, you can see what is or is not a ranking factor. So we can identify those things that Google is actually using as part of the algorithm or not. Getting into strength is a, is a, is a, a different issue, but you can actually then start layering tests to see strength. And I think yeah. um, uh, Ted does a very good job with that on, on the testing, testing methods that I think he's going to discuss. And okay. it's important to know that, you know, this isn't definitive proof. I mean, we can never definitively prove unless we are a search engineer at Google with source code access. Yeah. Well, all we could ever hope to get is proof, uh, you know, evidence uh, that that it's likely to be the case or, or plausible. And so if we can take like the field of possibilities of, you know, hey, here's a hundred different things we've been told are true about search from Google. Let's go test them and see if the results match the statements that were made. And if we find it's, you know, true for 10 of them and false for the rest of them, you know, that's a clue. And so we look for those clues. And what we found is that when we get a good collection of these clues, they tend to make it easy to rank well. And the, so, the only other thing I would add is the the idea of like the perfect solution fallacy. Just because something isn't perfect doesn't mean that it's all wrong. So just because we can't be 100% certain doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Gravity is still a theory. I feel pretty good about it. But it's still, <laughs> but it's still up in the air a little. So you know, when you come down to it, these tests may not be 1,000% conclusive in the, in the sense of you can just you know, take it to gravity's level. But I mean, it's still there as a valid thing. Yeah, to use to use the coin flip example again, there is a remote possibility that out of pure randomness, you would get a hundred heads in a row on a fair coin. There is a minute possibility that that could happen. It's highly unlikely, but we can never disprove that uh, that the hundred heads in a row uh, was fair randomness. So we can never guarantee that the coin is absolutely rigged. There's always this minuscule amount of, of probability that says, well, it could have been a random distribution. It's just highly unlikely to not be. And that's all we can do with uh, SEO testing too is say, hey, we've tested these single factors, they appear to matter in single variable testing, and then in field testing on actual websites, we tend to get pretty decent results. So we're feeling this is pretty plausible. I was in Vegas this past weekend and I saw a dealer turn over a blackjack five times in a row. Um, so the, the probability was, is, was very minute, especially when you look at the consecutive events, but then the machine broke. <laughs> and they had to come fix it. So take that for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> One other question, since we're still on SVTs, is how long do you leave these? Well, I know the answer, but Kyle, do you leave these op your testing open all the time, or you like run a test and be like, "Oh, it's good," and then kill it and move on to other things, or do you always follow along? It depends on the test. The problem is that I publish a lot of tests, and so a lot of people end up finding them, and then they're clicking on stuff, and it would. not pretty much invalidates the idea of the single variable. So once a test, once I've talked about it, I kind of just assume it's 
dead. And okay. I don't, I don't really worry about doing some, I do try to run for a long time, uh, but it's, that's hard to do. Well, it's hard to do when you're publishing. So if you're exactly, yeah, <laughs> I don't publish. So I like to leave them. I, I followed your advice from a long time ago and I just leave them up and, as the algorithm change, you go look at my test and see if anything changed there. So. That's exactly right. The other thing that's fun too is if the um, control pages shift, uh, but your um, your test page remain the same. Those there was probably an algo shift that then moved all of those pages that were duplicates. So you can kind of see when uh, Google is shifting things around. Yeah, and another thing, I never recycle test pages. Once I use right. them for a test, they are what they are, and then they're done. So we never update them after the initial use. Time check, we gotta get moving. <laughs> All right, so let me uh, stop sharing and reshare because it's gone bad on me again. <laughs> short format, Ted, short format. I know, sorry for the technical difficulties. Don't let him bully you, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> Fight Club. <laughs> Blink bad and okay. okay. So uh, what a lot of people have used for, you know, about a, the past year or so is what I call the two keyword method, where they invent two uh, keywords for each page. And so one of the keywords is a shared keyword that appears on all the pages, and the other keywords are pretty much identifiers for each test or control case. And the combination of those two give you unique URLs and, and uh, they require uh, they meet your minimum requirement for uniqueness to be indexed. And so this is the two keyword method. Um, what I use, what I'm trying to get everybody to adopt now is a three keyword method. And the reason I want to do that is that it turns out that having your keyword in the URL appears to be a very strong on-page factor. And so if we want to reduce variables, um, this is a keyword that we would not want to have be our target keyword. So by creating three keywords, we still satisfy our uniqueness, but our shared keyword is only used in the content of the page. And uh, one of the things I've uh, noticed in my experimentation is that fairly shared factors that are significantly strong spoil tests for uh, weak signal tests. So if you have, you know, something that's a very weak factor, like, you know, keyword in meta description, you might not be able to measure it if you have these heavy hitters also on your page, even if every page has them. Uh, any uh, comments on that? That's correct. The problem you run into when you're trying to set up test pages, though, is if you reduce the keyword from some of those stronger areas, such as the URL, the meta title, the H1, um, it becomes very frustrating because a lot of your test pages won't index. So it's, it's one of those things that you have to balance where if you're doing this on your own and you are the only resource that's creating these things, you're going to want to create a lot uh, of test pages in one go. So you've got just sets because sometimes some sets won't index. Yeah, yeah. And so far, I've had pretty good luck with this. I found that Google cares more about the the amount of content on the page versus what's actually uh, on these pages. So uh, segueing again, what goes in these pages? And so for my test cases, it basically boils down to this template. I have an empty head block. I don't populate keywords in the title. That's a, another fairly shared factor that can spoil some tests. Um, I don't use uh, headings with the keywords. That's another fairly shared factor that can spoil some text. Uh, but I do use random content. And I do put the shared keyword and the test page keyword on the page, but I try to make sure they're the last two words on the page. Any comments on this templating? I think what you're talking about, like kind of removing things so that um, you can't spoil the test. 
uh, kind of goes back to the idea of what you do to one, you can do to all. I think there are very few things that can actually spoil a test. And I think they are what we kind of just listed, the keyword in your, your meta title H1 and URL. And it's not consistently spoiled. The only way that it's actually spoiled is that if you're um, the term or whatever you're testing is so weak that those things are creating so much noise that, that they can't be seen. Um, that's the only time that it, I think they're actually spoiled um, or you really just not, you're not getting the result that you could be getting if you could just remove the, the larger noise factors. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I agree if, if you have a sufficiently strong signal on something you're testing, it's going to overcome that. Uh, it seems to be that, you know, weak signals tend to get lost by fairly shared factors. I think that's correct. Uh, so what goes into random content? Um, you know, there's famously and historically uh, random Latin, uh, but we worry that uh, uh, Google's onto that. And I've long suspected that when you have the... Uh, the translate this appear in the uh, search result that there's a demotion on that. So I tr tried not to have the incorrect language penalty if possible. Um, what do you think about randomly generated content? Do you have anything on that, Clint? <laughs> uh, you know, I, <coughs> I learned my testing stuff from Kyle. So that was the Laurel Mipson baby until Kyle opened his big mouth and decided to crush everyone in the SEO. <laughs> and Google was like, well, here's your Laura Mipson and take my D index for a present. So I've been using the random English. I like using it. I think that the problem that I see is that sometimes, and, it, and it's rare, it kind of messes with the test. Uh, but. I think if it if that random content is messing with what you're testing, then what you're testing is probably not worthwhile to be testing anyway. Is it, is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. I I use random English too, and for the random English, we take like you know the top two thousand English words that are completely devoid of context or sentiment, and we randomize those, and uh, it. It seems to make a, a pretty clear, uh, you know, pretty clean uh, body of text that doesn't have, you know, any contextual ties to what you're testing. Um, you got to avoid words like good and best and, and you know, things like that. I, per I personally don't have any problem with lorem ipsum. Don't tell Google, but I put a lot of <laughs> test domains back up and um, running them with lorem ipsum and, I'm, and they're not being found and I'm not really, I'm not running into any issues. Yeah, I know that uh, Josh uh, from the uh, uh, White Hat versus Black Hat channel, uh, he uses randomly generated alphanumeric uh, tokens. And even in his tests, he sometimes gets collisions. He he just through pure randomness generated the word sex and spoiled the test. That's funny. So uh, you know, all all of these methods probably have pros and cons. Um, but other considerations is how many words per page. If you have you know only one word on a page, like Kyle said, it's probably not going to index. It's probably going to get de-indexed. You're going to have a lot of trouble getting your test results. So you have to think about how much content you put on, and how much content you put on affects keyword density, which we think is is probably a factor or directly related to a factor. Because um, keep in mind, you have one mention on the page, so whatever other random words you put on that page change your keyword density. So you could accidentally uh, have an unfair test if you vary your words per page at all. Um, and then words per sentence, we don't know if there's an ideal sweet spot for sentence length because we haven't really tested that yet. So uh, we need to run some more tests, but you'd want to consider, does Google look for things that are formatted like sentences? Is punctuation required? Should sentences start with a capital letter? You know, if you're emulating these structures, you got to think about it. And then, of course, the number of sentences, uh, you know, may be a factor as well. Uh, there are a lot of good 
when I do the lorem ipsum, there are a lot of good lorem ipsum generators that actually, because they're giving you text to put into uh, a website uh, for filler text, so you can see what the text would look like. They do a pretty good job of emulating what actual text looks like. Um, I want to go back real quick, and I just double checked. When I do the lorem ipsum, I do not get the translate thing up top. Do you? Uh, I do. Uh, yeah. I've, yeah, I've got. I, the... I do not have it. And I was, yeah, and I was realizing when you said that, I was like, I don't think I've ever seen that, and I don't get it. Are you? Maybe putting in a uh, lang equals en on your HTML tag or something, forcing a context? It would only be if that's done, because I use um, different WordPress templates. So if that's a standard, yeah, en us. So there you go. Yeah, so that, that might nice be. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, it, it might be another variable. We got to be careful, too. Sure. But that's kind of interesting to, to get around that kind of issue of that, oh, it's Latin, who cares, or Google knows. Well, using the WordPress, it marks it as English. And Google's super smart. Yep. And by super smart, I mean not super smart. So other considerations are the, uh, the character length of the invented keywords. So as you can see in the uh, image below, uh, we invented one that was kind of short. And Google started doing this. Oh, did you mean expunged? Mm -hmm. And so we try we try to avoid behaviors like this. We don't want Google to auto show results for another term. So you got to make sure that your words are long enough and random enough and devoid of youth enough that they don't trigger other Google features. Um. And then uh, you know we talked about sources of testing error with the URL and the in the title, and then uh, there's the number of test cases you can do for a shared keyword, which we'll show in a minute. And then of course there's the number of controls. A number of controls is an area where I've started growing concern about the two above and two below. Um, so let's let's talk about that. So. I started using a, uh, a new testing standard that's different from the two above, two below that we've just seen. And I refer to it as RSVT for relative single variable testing. And in this methodology, I create a lot of test pages and I leave all of page one as control cases. I don't put any test cases on page one. And then below that, I can have any number of test cases for a shared keyword. And once I create everything and it gets a chance to stew in Google, what we're looking to see is which of the test cases beat all 10 controls. If it beats eight of them, it's inconclusive. It needs to be all 10 to be signal in this standard. And then we can also see how they rank relative to each other. So we get a relative indication of which test cases had the strongest effect and which test cases had the weakest effect. And uh, let's see, let's take a look at one. So here's a leaderboard of these test cases. And so when we look at this, this delta baseline, so we recorded a baseline after everything settled. In title tag, in this leaderboard, I created a test case for every tag and every HTML attribute in the W3, uh, W3C specification. So we have every single tag being tested side by side and against the controls. And for title tag, to get to number one on this leaderboard, it had to beat all 10 control cases on page one, as well as 103 higher ranking test cases. So title tag getting here, it had to move a lot. It had to beat a lot to get to the top. So that's a very strong signal. Ted, for the non-nerds, what does delta mean? Uh, change in. So change in, in uh, you know, from the baseline. So this originally ranked 113 places lower when we created the test cases after they settled. 
And so once Google crawled the test cases and adjusted for them, it shot up 113 places. So, so what you did was you created 200 pages. Your first 10 pages that were on page one were your control, and then you went back in and changed the other 190, adding those tags, and then let Google recrawl them again, I'm assuming, uh, and saw what happened with the changes. From yes, exactly. Look. And uh, these were different test cases, different test pages of the title tag, and all three of them shot to the top. And then here's our URL document name. This is why I'm worried about having keywords and URLs for test cases. Here's H1 tag. Here's why we're worried about having keywords in, in those uh, eight headings and, and test cases. And uh, I, I also do a uh, you know daily change. Are these things moving around? And it does appear that Google does do some A/B testing. So we'll see these things uh, flip. They'll go down. They'll come back. They'll go down. They'll come back. So there's a certain amount of A/B testing uh, that Google does. We don't know a lot about how it works. Uh, but we often refer to it as the volatile middle. And it seems like when Google deems a page as worthy enough, uh, you don't A-B test. You don't timeshare with other pages. You get to hold on to your spot. And so we're trying to learn more about that behavior too, but it's something that we can see in these leaderboard style tests. Ted, I know you just started doing these, but um, have you uh, replicated any of them? So you've got the exact same leaderboard running to, to compare and contrast. Yeah, yeah. I did the entire uh, HTML specification test twice. So I have two different shared keywords for two different uh, incarnations of testing the whole spec. And largely what ranks at the top is the same on both. There's some minute differences. And we refer to those differences as uh, uh, MRV, minute random variance, because it appears that part of Google's system might be to add a teeny tiny random number to every page's uh, ranking score. And when you're sufficiently equivalent to another page, you can randomly flip with those equivalent pages based on this random number Google's adding to your score. And Google appears to re-roll it you know, three, four times a day. Um, and so when what I see when we properly reduce the variables in a test case, things don't, don't settle. They get really volatile because all you have left is that random number Google is re-rolling. But then once you put in your test cases, then you get your signal, then things just fall into a set order, and you don't see that random variance until you get way into the middle or towards the bottom. How, how are you tracking this? A uh, single variable is pretty easy to see what, where your trust is doing. What are you using to, to track 200 pages? Oh, I, I can pull these leaderboards daily, and I can just walk through the timeline and see the movers and shakers. So I just uh, re-pull the leaderboards every day and watch the movement. And like you said before, if there's a Google update, I come back. Uh, and again, I don't publish my test cases, so I don't show people my secret words. I keep them very private. And then uh, another uh, part of this is controls. So down here at number 54 on the same leaderboard, you see these controls. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six of them here. So all these tags right here, all these test cases didn't beat all 10 controls. They appear below. And because of that, all of these tags hypothetically speaking, beat two controls. They went above two control cases. And that's one reason why I have concern about having two above, two below, is that you might not catch the random variance where these didn't beat all 10 controls when they should have. 
So that, that MRV, that minute random variance, might cause these tags to beat two controls, but not to beat 10 controls. And so I'm really advocating getting more controls into testing because of that minute random variance. The, the thing you run into, though, is the random part. You can't randomly have something that moves five times up and then randomly moves five times down. Uh, well, actually, these will shift around and we'll see, you know, we'll see them go below. Sometimes we'll see them go above five controls. It's just mm -hmm. less likely that they'll randomly go above 10. It's still possible that they would. But when once I started using more control cases, it became clear that to me that two controls was a, a more risky venture because of that random variance. Sure. So um, I know we're over on time. Here's something to toss out at you, though. So it's very, these are all in one domain, right? Yes. So it's very common for one domain to rank uh, multiple pages for the same keyword, three, four, five, even more sometimes. But it is highly unlikely, and I've never seen in the wild, where one site is ranking 200 plus pages or 150 pages for the same keyword. So what you're seeing here as minute random variation is actually keyword cannibaliz cannibalization. You are cannibalizing your own pages and it's actually masking and spoiling your results. Uh, that's possible. But uh, in <laughs> your it, it does it in a reproducible and predictable way. And the things that people generally agree are the strongest do generally appear at the top. And so it's also possible that two controls just simply isn't enough because of the minute number that Google's adding to your ranking score could have it fluctuate two spots on relatively equivalent cases. So it's entirely possible that I'm still right. Or it's entirely possible that you've actually got the exact same problem, but in reverse. Um, Yours are too big. <laughs> it's possible, but again... I like that you yeah. don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hadn't thought of this before. But the thing is, like you said before, with the repeat and testing, like I've done a lot of leaderboards. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of those leaderboards it sorts all the results for the thing we're testing. And, you know, that's that's an important clue is that, you know, it, if you're gonna get that kind of chaos, it should be in all of the tests and it's not. So, you know, I, I would still lean towards the fact that what we're seeing is a minute amount of score being randomly added to, to pages you know, Google's way of doing random fair tiebreakers or a random A-B testing of equivalent results to figure out, you know, which one should ultimately go where. Um, or just being fair to tie cases and scores. Um, you know, it, it, it seems to me, we, we haven't proved anything, but it, it seems to me that the minute random variance theory probably has the best legs. From what I've seen. I think what you're going to need to do is is the the repeating of it and then categorizing where everything is actually landing because it should be pretty much the same if, if that MRV, you're going to have those chunks that land in, in those certain areas because then they're all getting the attachment of they're in this range. So then all these guys are going to shuffle. And if you can see that repeated, then I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. And and. You know, that's that's largely what we see between the, the two incarnations of this test is we have, the uh, for the most part, the same winners. We have, for the most part, the same weak ones and the same losers. I think the point that I would like to make, though, is that the your knock on the other version, you have the exact same knock and your answer is exactly the same, that, it, that it's in, that we can repeat this and see it. Um, well, but the thing is, is the awareness. like. The fact that I can see these test cases beating two controls and being inconclusive is important. Like that right there is a very important detail. But and you're understanding that it's beating two controls one way 
And then when you run the test in the inverse in the single variable, it, it, it has to beat it the other way as well. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, you, you still need that. But the fact the fact that it we can demonstrate it beating two controls but not beating three is very important. Is this, do you have this set up, like you gave me those other test pages, do you have this set up in much the same way where you can just change the keyword and duplicate that test automatically over and over again? Uh, it's a bit harder than that, uh, but it, it can be done. Because I was, I was thinking it would be probably beneficial to scale this up a little bit. When we got two, we can make some assumptions. What happens if we each do 20? And you just make us 20 sets of this each. And we set up 20 and let's sit and then do like Kyle said, look across all 20 and see, you know, what is being, what is the same across all 20? Yeah. Um, doing, doing the whole HTML specification that way, that's probably a week of work. Um, so but you're super Ted, so it's an hour, right? <laughs> I know, right. What's, what's, what's that? Yeah. It, it's a week for a mortal. <laughs> it's not a week for a Ted. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, that, that would be a cool thing to do. It would be a matter of finding the time to do it. Yeah. Or at least, you know, Kyle's kind of smart. So show one of us how, to, how, how you're making these and we can kind of figure it out. <laughs> or hire a ninja. <laughs> so uh, here's here's another leaderboard. So, you know, i got to show you more. Uh, this one, I was looking at word count. And I saw these results where uh, word count, it didn't matter what word count, it never beat control. You know, they beat some of the controls just randomly, again, the minute random variance, uh, but it wouldn't beat all controls. And there was some ordering to it. And when I looked at the order, I was like, wow, that's, that's a really interesting curve with one outlier. And these controls, are all 500 words. So these are 500 words all went to the top and it's like, wow, that's really interesting. Why does why does Google prefer 500 words? Would you like an answer? Sure. So you launched everything with 500 words to start, right? And then you changed. Yeah, yeah, they were all 500 word controls. So it's possible that what just happened is that you set the standard for that term. It sat long enough that that is what um, Google adopted for that particular keyword that it likes 500 words because that's all the pages that it saw initially. It saw 100 and some odd pages that were all 500 locked it in. So, okay, that's the right amount. And that's that's possible. I can't disprove that. Um, <clears throat> But when I look at the correlation of it, you know, so that's that nice curve we're looking at. That that really had me thinking that you know we're we're measuring something here. Google's measuring something here and working with it. And so those those results I showed you had very strong correlation with with rank position, um, and that more word count was worse. And I was wondering why that could be. And so I repeated it. Because what I didn't have test cases for was from 10 words to 400 words. So my smallest pages were 500. And I said, well, I have to see if this pattern continues. And with the top ranking results, the pattern continued. It still had that trending. And so it favored smaller and smaller pages. And I was wondering, why is that? And my leading theory is that it's that keyword density from episode one is coming back to haunt us again. Because I have one keyword on each of these pages, and it's ranking based on density, it would seem. Can you factor that in? Just add the keyword? Uh, yeah, like we could go in and uh, change the density of like uh, control eight at add a keyword in there or two to make it go up. I mean, as you add keywords, you can just add, um, as you have blocks of text, you can add keywords and keep density the same across all the pages. Um, yeah, the, it would get- The only thing you worry about there is term more. frequency. Yeah, and it, it would get pretty fractional. Like we could get close to the same keyword density, <laughs> but we couldn't get exactly. Nobody's gonna argue if you're at- <laughs> You know, shooting sure. for two and one's 1 1.9 and one's 2.1. Yeah, but we don't know what Google does. So that's the, 
that's the thing. It might actually matter if, if it's a thing in Google, but we could test because, it. I mean, you're trying to test the words, right? Yeah, yeah. So then the idea is that you need to eliminate the variables. And what, what you've got, what you're showing is you've actually, you're working two variables, the number of words and the density that are on the page. Yeah, yeah. So I guess uh, we could do that, try to try to do it. But it, again, you know, it'll it'll be tricky because we'll have fractional discrepancies no matter how good we try to get. For sure, but they won't go into the, the thousandths of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have we'll have less. But if you eliminate the density issue, and like you said, now you created the term frequency issue. Isn't that another variable in itself? For sure. So that the the idea of let's let's zero out one of them. You know, let's zero out the density and make sure that that is not what we're seeing. Because if it isn't, if it's if the density isn't the factor, then then it'll it'll all start to line up based on the word count, or then the the frequency. So you could run it both ways to see where the changes actually happen and where you're actually just getting word count. So would it be smart to create a test to compare density against word count? Yeah. Density and word count, density and term frequency. Yeah. And figure out which one is more powerful and then eliminate that one. That's right. Okay. Yeah. We have a, uh, a stats guy who reviews a lot of our data. Uh, his name is Lee. And, and hats, hats off to Lee. Lee is a smart cat. I, and I'm willing to bet you right now uh, he's at home screaming at his computer screen. <laughs> <laughs> he sends me, I actually, after the last one, he sent me like a block of text, and I was like, I'll just get to that later. <laughs> I love you, Lee. <laughs> but if you don't, no, it's have fantastic. Lee is a bright guy. Yeah, if you don't have a Lee, I recommend you get one. <laughs> and you can't have ours. Um, so yeah, when, when I looked at the density, I got the, the right correlation for ranking well, and it was a very strong correlation for what we're seeing is, is probably density. Um, and so, yeah, you know, in a nutshell, that's testing. Good stuff. Lots of fun. Do we have time for a few questions? Gotta hustle. Gotta hustle. We're already over. Okay. Uh, Clint, you want to pick a few questions out? Uh, let's see. I guess it's impossible to do pure testing that incorporates Google's growing focus on content and context. Well, sure. I mean, if you take um, so instead of doing uh, uh, um, uh, randomly generated letters or uh, some something for a word, you can take like a three word phrase that doesn't make any sense. Uh, beer, comb, cheese, you know. Uh, why all those three things are on my mind. Actually, I think I used that in a test earlier. Somebody I know uses that in the test. But the idea is that you end up with smaller results, but you actually get some context. So then you can start playing with um, LSI, NLP, TF, IDF, whatever you like from that. So you get a smaller environment. Obviously, it's a little more alive, but it's pages that people aren't really intentionally um, optimizing for, but you can still get some approximation there. Doesn't that uh, break the single variable constraint? Yeah, I mean, you have to live with that tolerance. And then the idea is that you do like regression analysis or just run it multiple, multiple times to make sure that you're still on point. Yeah. And, and I think it's okay that not all tests are single variable tests. You can do field testing. You know, there are other kinds of testing that you can do. Well, I like that people try to uh, mention that this invalidates everything, but then that would invalidate, you know, all science because earth isn't a closed system. You know, there, there's still things happening on the planet that can uh, impact any kind of scientific experiment that's actually going on in actual science. So yeah. just because these things happen, I mean, you just have to then, again, it's degrees of confidence. Yeah, and, and what we typically do when we get strong clues out of single variable testing, that you know, the obvious next step, it's let's go test it in the field. Well, that's something else that people need to understand too, is that we're all SEOs. We actually do this. So this isn't just some academic thought experiment and and we'll just leave it at that we actually then take these things and and actually implement them and that gives us even higher degrees of confidence when things actually start to work yeah i'm a baby seo compared to these two these two guys are the, the real testers i'm going out there and applying all the stuff and saying hey look that didn't work or this did work that did work in, in the real world on, on client sites and my own money sites um so i'm kind of validating what they're doing in the real world but you know they're doing it themselves they just don't like to brag about the real world stuff that they do well we we need uh, you know we need field testers. We need Clint out there, you know, saying, "Hey, I, I tried this theory you had, and it was total BS." You know that we need that feedback. 
because when you sign, when you find something that works in a in a test environment, or you, know, you can see it in the leaderboard, it, it, it's continually working, but then you can't apply it. That means there's something else going on. We're missing it in the test. Uh, next question: In these cases, using random words, how would suggest testing a case to see how translation word usage would affect the rankings or transition word usage? I'm sorry, I missed that entirely. Ted, did yeah. you get that? Can you answer? <laughs> Uh, I I don't understand that one. Yeah, well, uh, read it again, and I'll and I'll take another crack at it. Yeah, or reword it, Mike. So it is original question in these test cases uh, with using random words. How would you suggest testing a case to see how transition word usage would affect rankings? Yeah, I don't know what transition yeah, word yeah. usage is. Yeah. So Mike, if you're still around, bring that one up. And then uh, last one from Terry. When you say random, you mean English words or just random words that do not even create sentences? Ran uh, I use random words that don't even create sentences. Because uh, the, the Laura Mipsum stuff that Kyle has done for, for the past year is uh, proven without a shadow of a doubt that Google is not reading your content. They're not even checking if your words are words. So Google has to change for that to change. And so I, we haven't seen that yet. Okay. And then Mike updated transition words, examples, although, therefore, because. Oh, things like stop words? Um, yeah. All, although, therefore, as, because, until you want if though i mean that's you you take those common words and they're when you string them together they have no meaning or context and then you put your one keyword on so if you get the if you get the right set of extremely common devoid of uh context or sentiment words you can just randomize them and, and they work the same as latin Uh, and then I like because this one's a good. This is the last question. Mind expanding on what you mean by Google not even reading the content. Well, so uh, you can. Grammar isn't a factor. Spelling isn't a factor. Using bad words isn't a factor. Readability. Uh, readability isn't a factor. And whichever readability uh, you like, Flesh Kincaid, onto the other five or six that exist, none of those things are franking factors. Yeah, Google's not reading your content and algorithmically measuring the quality of it. Yeah, it's not making any value judgment that this is good content versus that's not good content. Because, then, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I cut you off, Ted. Oh, uh, I was going to say, uh, because if Google was doing that, they wouldn't have ranked Kyle's uh, rhinoplasty Latin page to the top of page one. That's yeah, exactly but I think that to the you have to define reading in this case reading as in like reading a book or reading as in going through the code and, and quickly assessing the code they download the source they count uh match words in the source you know they're doing those things but they're not reading it to say oh this was a really great article on this topic and it was written at a college level and the industry is going to really appreciate the insights and in paragraph two it's not doing any of that okay perfect yeah because it, right, it has to read a, a machine reads not a human and if you guys have more questions, just leave them in the chat, and Kyle, Ted, and I will jump in there and answer what we can uh, in the uh, in the comments of the video afterwards. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Remember to subscribe and to ring the notification bell if you want to be notified uh, when we go live. And also be sure to check out uh, SEO this week. Again, it's a huge time saver if you don't want to spend hours combing through dozens and dozens of news articles to get to the best ones. So thanks again, guys. Thank you. See you, everybody.